I always say that communication is a skill that takes a moment to learn and a lifetime to master. The challenge then becomes is like, how do you communicate the story well in a way that resonates with the people that hear it? This week on Passion and Progress, Jeff Bartsch of Story Greenlight. Jeff is a full-time TV editor in Hollywood. He's worked for ABC, NBC, Apple, Universal, Disney, ESPN, MTV, and many others. He's also written a book, Edit Better, Hollywood Tested Strategies for Powerful Video Editing. But above all, Jeff has this thing called Story Greenlight. Simply put, he has a YouTube channel that uses creative video editing and powerful storytelling to help video creators tell the stories they care about the most. While I was a full-time senior video editor at The Chive, I came across some of Jeff's videos on YouTube, and they really helped my craft in telling stories. And my hope is for you, the listener, to benefit from some of the things that Jeff has to say about story, because the man really knows what he's talking about. And we can all benefit from being able to tell a good story, right? So before I get into the podcast, I just want to say thank you to all my listeners and the support that they've given me thus far. Thank you so much to all those people that have been sharing it on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, everywhere. It's It's been so cool to see this in different spots just spread across the internet. With that being said, let's keep this train rolling. If you want to support the podcast, tweet it out on Twitter, share it on Facebook, take a screenshot of the podcast, put it in your Instagram stories, and at me, I'm at at Javier Mercedes X. I use the hashtag passion and progress for all my stuff. And if you really want to support, you could open up your iTunes app and give me a review on iTunes. Today's iTunes review comes from Uncle Two Chains. I love hearing how excited Javi gets to interview these individuals from all different walks of life. There are so many nuggets of wisdom in each interview, and it's truly inspiring to hear about each individual's journey and the determination it's taken them to get where they are. Thank you, Uncle Two Chains. It's reviews like that that keep my passion and progress going. So thank you so much. Now let's take it out to that place where a lot of stories are produced and made. Hollywood. Jeff Barch of Story Greenlight. Here we go. What is up, Merce Nation? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress podcast. And this is the best place I've ever recorded a podcast in. We are in the the American Ninja Warrior just like building, uh, do, doing a, a podcast. And I say that because... I'm sitting in front of a person. He edits American Ninja Warrior. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Barch, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, man. It is so cool to be here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of geeked out on the space too. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a nice little uh, open industrial vibe. I got it. I, I like it. So uh, you're here in Hollywood. Yep. You're like the quintessential of like, when, when people think of an editor, it's like, it's here, it's in Hollywood and yep. doing that type of stuff. How did you get here? Give me, give me uh, the spiel of um, your history and everything. Like, how did you get to this point? Like, what's your background in editing? And then the, like, we'll get to the story greenlight stuff too. But sure. I just, I just want to give people a context of the gravitas of stuff you've worked on and things like that. At this point, I've been editing for almost. Well, it depends on depends on one's definition of editing. I mean, like, I actually my my, my first editing work that I did was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I. But I, I suppose better. Let's just uh, time warp back a little bit. Um, I actually started out as a musician. I started taking piano lessons when I was four years old yeah. and uh, started doing that. And I got into multi-track recording. It was like I was bouncing songs back and forth between my brother's boom boxes back in the day. And mm -hmm. uh, I got into junior high and I started r recording uh, my synthesizer and multi-track stuff with my computer. And, and I didn't even know that anything beyond that was available. But when I got into high school, my art teacher said, Jeff, I think you should do a video. I'm like, okay, why not? And this was me in ninth grade. And I put together this first ever video that was so boring. You could feel your brain cells dying. It was <laughs> that like there are like five or six people on the face of the planet who have seen that video and none of them want to see it again, <laughs> you know, including myself. I'm just like, okay, moving on. But I was in a high school with 200 people, nine through 12, Northwest Iowa, a town of a thousand people called Newell, Iowa. And uh, I was the only one who cared about video stuff. And so I just started learning. And eventually I realized that all this stuff with all my music that I've been learning for years and all the stuff that I was learning about shooting and editing, it all came together in that editing. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all the stuff at the end, that's where it came together. 
I, I did the annual graduation videos that like basically the entire town showed up in the gymnasium of the high school. guy. Like, <laughs> a Jeff Birch production. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that was uh, so I actually did gain a little bit of notoriety, which was cool because otherwise I had zero idea how to relate to people. I had very few friends, uh, horrible social skills, but at least people respected me because I knew how to play the piano and I knew how to make them look good on on the video mm -hmm. stuff. And I got into college, studied more about music, came out here to Los Angeles to transfer to film school where I ran out of money. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing that I ever got out of film school was the phone number from the head of the film department of the guy who ended up giving me my first break. And uh, basically he said, we need someone to be an assistant editor on the show in Hollywood. Do you know how to run the Avid, which is the industry standard editing platform in L.A. and New York? It used to be everywhere, but that's changing. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know how to run the Avid. And he's like, if you want to come in for Friday and Sunday nights, we can teach you. Sold. Great. Done. And so the next time a position opened for a full-time assistant editor, I was the obvious choice. I'd been coming in Friday and Sunday nights for free for five months. And uh, I was the guy. So that's how I actually got my first job in TV in Hollywood. I had to drop out of film school, but I busted my tail working hard enough so that I impressed the film professors who were willing to give me a hookup to the guy who gave me my first break. You were very, dare I say, passionate about yes. it. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and ever since then, uh, I actually made the jump to full editor at that same production company, which is not, that, that's actually kind of rare because mm -hmm. people like to put you in, in boxes and they say, oh, well, you're a great assistant editor, but you're not editor material and whatever. We all want to put people in boxes. And so thankfully, people gave me that shot and I worked my tail off and uh, I didn't suck enough such that they let me keep doing it. And I've been editing ever since. Besides uh, American Ninja Warrior and working on that, is there any other projects that you would like to bring up that like that people would know about? Actually, a, a lot of the stuff that I've cut, no one's ever really seen, mm -hmm. which is pretty typical for oh, professional I, editors. You know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of the stuff uh, that I've done has been um, unscripted work, mm -hmm. uh, documentary style work, uh, docudrama series, that kind of stuff. Um, I did work on a show that aired on ABC a while back called Super Nanny, mm -hmm. where uh, a British nanny comes over and helps American families whip their kids into shape random factoid which i know you're into voiceover i was actually the voiceover guy for super nanny for six seasons nice and there's a really cool story about how that happened so maybe we can get into that later i mean if you want to tell it right now sure. well uh, basically i was cutting the first season of super nanny and my edit bay was across the hallway from the post-production supervisor and i heard her say we need a voice guy for the show it needs to be you know, baritone, male, not too high, not too low, family friendly, you know, and just not too big or blasty. I'm just like, oh, ooh, 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 you know, <laughs> and they and they're like, yeah, we want we want a real voice guy. So go back to your cave and edit like a good monkey kind of a thing. <laughs> yes. In the box. So what happened was it's like, well, I when I was in college, like I'd actually been doing radio work. And so it was like this was not a new thing to me. So I actually brought in my microphone. And I, I wrote up some scratch voiceover tracks and I edited them together because I knew how to do that. And I burned CDs and I started handing out CDs to the producers on the show. One of them ended up in the hands of the executive producer of the show who didn't know where it came from. And he popped it into his laptop, started listening. He's like, okay. And then they, and he's like, who is this? He's like, oh, that's Jeff. Bay number four. It's like, what? calls up the picks up the phone Jeff get in here <laughs> so basically my scratch tracks my temporary tracks that I recorded they let they let me record temporary tracks for that first episode of Super Nanny it went out to network and no one at the network complained so I ended up being the guy for six seasons that's awesome yeah. What, so what would that entail? Uh, was it just like transitions and everything like and then they went to this spot? But like what what was a typical thing that you no, would say? It, most most of the time it would be it would be like the cold open, like the first 90 seconds of the show coming up on Super Nanny tonight. Joe, yeah, Joe yeah. meets the Smith family. The Smith's family are a nightmare, you know, just that kind of stuff. And of course, you got to get you got to get 
you got to go high and you got to go low. Will Joe figure it out? You know, it's just, it, it sounds totally cheesy to talk like this person to person, but when you hear it on playback, it actually, it's, it's the energy that translates that you need. Yeah. If only everybody talked like that in real life, <laughs> it would be great. I think that would be weird. Yeah. So I think one of the, one of the things that fascinates me um, about voiceover is people don't understand the the how much there is just everywhere everything or just sound in general just everything has 50 percent of all video is sound so yeah. it, or and it doesn't even have to do with video it's like you get onto a bus well who do you think is somebody had to record that thing that says don't watch your step like yeah. somebody recorded that in another place you know so I think like when I hear stories about that, it's like you never know like a voice behind something. And whenever I go to like say a transit system and I hear something, I'm like, oh, that's Tony Mansano. I I've recorded him. Like, okay. oh, that's, like, that, like he's the he's the guy for whatever. Or mm -hmm. I'll like like try this new vitamin thing and like I'll yeah. hear it and I'll be like, oh, that was uh, like Mike Stout or something like like yeah. like in the in the in the realm of things. But I I find that so fascinating. Getting to Story Greenlight and what you're doing now, uh, there's one concept that I know will come up uh, that you do, that's a through line throughout your videos, but I, there's another video that I was watching and there was a phrase that was said, I, I forget that it was, it was another YouTuber um, and he's a salesman and at the end of the video he said, facts tell, stories sell. What does a phrase like that mean to you? Oh man, that means, that means are you being human or not? I can't tell you how many times, like, like I'm, I'm a big audiobook guy. I'm, I'm an aural learner. I love hearing things. So like when I'm listening to an audiobook, there are things where if the, if the audiobook is talking about, this is the things that are, this is the way things are, and this is the way things ought to be, or, or like it's talking about nutrition and it's talking about these really dry facts and everything. I'm just like, uh, okay, I'm struggling to follow along, but man, if you, if you wrap that stuff in a story and you put it, fine, talk about all the medical facts or all the, the features of your product. But if you wrap it in a story, all of a sudden people have a way to latch onto it. They have a way to identify with that. And all of a sudden they have a way to care. It's, it's, I can't, I, as you could get, I, I could, I could ramble on this forever. Um, cause, cause like story is one of the primary ways that we connect as human beings, period. It's the, it's one of the main ways we make sense of the world. And we've been doing it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so when people, when people talk about it, it's like, well, I don't know if I have any stories to tell, or I don't know how to tell stories. It's like, Number one, that's patently not true because we're all living a story. Our lives are a story. We start, we're born, there's stuff in the middle, and then we come at some point to an end. We are all living a story. And it's just the, the, the challenge then becomes is like, how do you communicate the story well in a way that resonates with the people that hear it? With, uh, in terms of what you do for a living, how does that relate? Well, so for instance, you talk about American Ninja Warrior. Um, so it's this massive, massive show on a massive television network. It's not just a television show. It has literally become a movement of people who are like, I want, I want to get off the couch and I want to get more active and I want to challenge myself with these obstacles. Man, you want to talk about fighting to overcome obstacles in a ninja gym? That's exactly what we're all faced with in our life from day to day. One of the big ideas that I'm always talking about is this is is the thing under the thing, and, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, are we gonna go? This like, where should we go? This like, because th this is a big, big, big deal. I mean, like, if you get this, if you get this when you're telling a story, your audience will love you for life, mm -hmm. because so often what we do, we go about our daily lives, and we see what's happening on the surface, but then we find ourselves feeling stuff. Whenever we see a thing or an event and we start feeling stuff, nine out of 10 times, it's because it's being driven by things underneath the surface element. And so the surface is what I refer to as the thing. It's being driven by the thing under the thing. It's the layers of symbolism and context that add additional layers of meaning 
under the surface. So on a show like American Ninja Warrior, it's, it's right there in front of you. I mean, like, it's an obstacle course. We face obstacles throughout our life. Will the athlete overcome the obstacles? Will, will he or she get to the end? And, and, and so it's like, that's, that is the overarching thing. It's an obstacle course on American Ninja Warrior. The thing under the thing is struggling to overcome what stands in our way. And man, I don't know anyone who can't find a way to identify with that. And that's one of the reasons why the show is so incredibly popular because it has all these different ways for people watching it to resonate with what's happening underneath the surface. It's such a physical representation of an analogy of overcoming a challenge. Mm -hmm. Within my own uh, journey doing this podcast in relation to uh, watching your own content and asking myself those things uh, as an editor, like when I'm seeing something, I'm like, I'm asking myself, well, why are we doing that? Why are we showcasing this B-roll at this point, you know, as I go through an edit, if I'm like sitting in the room with somebody or something like that. And then when you came out with that video, I was like, ah, oh, no, no, it has context of like what I'm trying to like portray. I, I think it's like another version of asking yourself why the, the tip of the iceberg, you're like, all right, there's that. And then underneath it, if you keep asking yourself why for this content as it goes along, like what is the purpose of it and what's the driving um, factor that you're trying to get to the audience? It's like if somebody's going to take the time to watch this, you as an editor should be taking the time to present them with as much value as you can within those short snippets of time. 100%. Within YouTube and what you're doing now, how does it relate? Like when you're when you're doing content creation and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. The the number one thing that I'm wanting to get at with my channel is I've built my career here in Hollywood where for so long Hollywood was the only game in town. Mm -hmm. You know, people would come here with a story to tell and they would say I I want to tell my story to a big, to a, to a, to a large platform of people. And so you would go to a television studio or a movie net, a, a, a television network or a movie studio, and you would be asking for what the industry term is. It's you are looking for a green light. You're looking for permission to use their, their assets, their gear and their platform to spread your message. Mm -hmm to an audience to on a wide scale. And that's all completely changed because now, you know, we're, we're sitting surrounded by readily accessible technology. You can pull out this guy and- He's, he's referring to a cell phone. Yeah. For can, those just listening. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you can pull out the, you can pull out a cell phone and just say, uh, and you can hit record and you can hit upload and you now have the gear, you have the platform and, you have it all at your fingertips. The thing that remains is you still need to get your own green light. And what it is, it's not external permission from somebody. You don't need the permission of some faceless studio executive who's operating on, some, on their own priorities, certainly not on yours. They're doing what's good for them and for the network. You need to give your own self the green light. You need to give yourself permission to stand up and say, I have a story worth sharing to the world. And so that's, that's the core of what Story Greenlight is all about because Hollywood used to be the only game in town and now that has changed and my mission is to help people find Hollywood in themselves wherever they are. Wow, what a statement. That's so good. W within the context of your whole channel and what you're talking about is there's so much intention behind whatever you bring for each video, meaning something as simple as, and I know it's not simple, the phrase that you say at the beginning of every single video, mm -hmm. can you say it? Howdy, it's Jeff Barch with Story Greenlight, where we're all about empowering you to tell the stories you care about the most. That's what we're all about. So if you blah, 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 hit the bell, hit the like, blah, blah, blah. Boom. <laughs> like having your mantra down. Yeah. So when you're building your content and everything in that matter, as you have progressed in your, and you get more of a feel for your audience, how ha, has it changed how you, how you allude or not allude to, but how, how has the journey been since, um, I like nine, 10 months ago to now. And like, when you produce it is like, I think this will be valuable to people or Hey people, or maybe you're, not. you're, you're, you're telling yeah. me after you've seen what I have to offer. Oh, I didn't even think about making this kind of thing, but I know about that. How, mm -hmm. How's it been? Well, it's like just talking about the mission of the channel and, and how you communicate that. Um, I, if you look at some of the earlier videos, I occasionally say something like, 
So keep telling your stories and consider this your green light to take your stories to the world. You know, you know, it's because green lights in the name of the channel is like tying it all together. Da, da, da. Yeah. But really, I realize it's like, no, that's not cool. Because what that is saying is that the permission, like this is your green light to take your stories to the world. is like as if I'm the one giving the permission. I'm like, no, that's not where the permission needs to come from. The permission needs to come from the creator, not from me, not this guy. So I stopped saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, shoot, now what, what's, what's my thing now? But, uh, and, and then it got, it got more wordy because what I'm, what I'm talking about, what I started talking about was, hey, it's Jeff with Story Greenlight, we're all, where we're all about helping you connect with your audience, turn up the impact of your work, and change people's lives. Uh, or actually what, how the, uh, the initial version of that was, Hey, it's Jeff with story green light, where we use creative video editing and powerful storytelling skills to help you connect with your audience, turn up the impact of your work and change people's lives. And, and you're grinning because it's like, <laughs> dang, that's a mouthful. I was like, okay, I'm just going to get tired of saying that. And people are going to get tired of hearing it. <laughs> so it's been an evolution of like, well, really, what is that all about? I mean, I, you know, and, and, and I'm not being cute about like the, what's the thing under the thing. It's like, this isn't, this isn't just about creative video editing and storytelling skills. This is about you giving yourself your own green light. It's you empowering yourself. So the current, as of this recording, <laughs> the current version, <laughs> the current version is it's where, where we're all about empowering you to tell the stories you care about the most. And there it it was like it keeps getting like shorter and yeah. shorter and shorter. Um, it yeah, as I keep creating content, it's more like like a general idea of like well, I like meeting people and I want to talk about what they're passionate about and all this other stuff. But it, like as it progresses, I was more of the mindset like I just want to do this. I'm gonna start doing it and then see how it evolves. And then as it evolves is when you can start to like chip away at. All right, this is what it's becoming. You know. Yeah. Um, and that's that's why I appreciate. Uh, like just seeing your channel and just being like, it's this. And, 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 and then it like, but no, the content sp speaks to what you're saying. That being said, do you have like a good success story of somebody that you've interacted with uh, via just giving them the power to tell their own story or if somebody was having a hiccup in what they wanted to do? Well, one of the things that, what, one of the challenges that people run into a lot, you know, when they, when, when they do make that choice and say, hey, yes, I do have a story worth telling. Yes, there is an audience for me. Yes, I'm going to do this. Then the next challenge is, okay, well, what do I do? And a lot of the time people say, it's like, yeah, I'd love to work stories into my stuff, but I don't feel like I have anything, like my, my life is boring. I don't feel like I have much to talk about, you know? And the fact of the matter is, you can make almost anything boring if you want to. I mean, you can talk about a farm girl who gets hit on the head and has a daydream and wakes up after having a weird dream. Well, that sounds kind of boring, but that's the Wizard of Oz, you know? <laughs> I didn't even flow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, but, and, and so the thing is, it's like, how do you take, how do you take what happens and how do you tell that story? And so the, one of the things people have to come to believe for themselves is even if you feel like your life is boring, you absolutely do have stories to tell. It's just a matter of how you shape those stories in a way that your audience resonates with. Which is which then asks the question is like, well, who is your audience and what do they want? What do they expect? And, and, and all, all of a sudden you start going down all these rabbit holes and even that can start feeling overwhelming. So it's uh, I, I always say that communication is a skill that takes a moment to learn and a lifetime to master. Mm -hmm. And I'm most definitely still learning myself. That speaks towards one of your other uh, videos and the concepts that you talk about. And I, I kind of wanted to put a dovetail on it, and it's the quantity versus quality. Yeah. And I think, in my mind, the argument is quantity till quality, or quantity, like the more quantity that you have, the more the like it gets to the point of quality, but you want to just put out quantity and become more effective to produce the quality by just putting out quantity. There were so many Q U words in there, <laughs> but um can you can you speak about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean like and, and I'm just I I'm, I'm just gonna go straight to the story that I told in that in that video. Um there is a book that talks about a ceramics professor that decided this semester this professor told her students, 
Half of you are going to be graded strictly on the quality of your work that you do. The other half will be graded on the quantity. So if you're being graded for quantity, this half of you students, we're going to put all your pots on a scale at the end of the semester. And in order to get an A, you need to have done like 50 pounds of pottery. You get a B, you had just 40 pounds of pottery, et cetera. Now, you other guys and gals with being graded on quality, um, you don't have to make 50 pounds of pottery. You only have to make one, but it's got to be perfect in order to get an A. So they go throughout their semester, and at the end of the semester, the crazy thing was, as the professor was looking at the pieces of pottery that were the most excellent, had the most quality to them, they were all coming from the group that were being graded for how much they made. They were all coming from the quantity people. And whereas the, the, the sad, the sad outcome for the people who were just being graded on the quality and they only had to do a little bit, they never got to the point where they got good at it because all their stuff sucked because they didn't put the, put in the repetitions. They didn't actually do it enough to get good at it. Mm -hmm. So really the, you know, you think about, oh man, he or she is so good at creating content. Um, well, yeah, you do. You, you put out a couple hundred videos or you do a thing like that over and over and over. You're going to figure out some stuff along the way, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, it, the, 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 the big thing for me, you know, working here in Hollywood, I am paid to obsess over every tiny detail. That just warms my heart. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. I, I, I am captain detail. I am captain of obsess over it all. So when I hear so, so, much, so much of the time on, you know, on, on online media, especially with YouTube, you hear people say, it's like, forget about detail, forget about making it good. Done is better than perfect. Just get it out there. Which to me, in my mind, sounds like people are saying quality doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's crap, just put it out there and just create more crap. And I'm like, um, excuse me, I don't do crap. I don't want to create crap. I do not want to be known for doing crap. You know, I want to be a man of excellence in my content creation, in my life. Just that's who I am. And I'm just like, ah, you know? <laughs> so there's no other better way yeah. to explain it. So it's just, it, it's one of those ways. It's one of those things where, um, this story really helped me realize that you don't necessarily have to sacrifice quality for the sake of quantity. I mean, sometimes you, that's not completely true. Sometimes you, what you, you just have to get to a point where you don't obsess over every single detail as much. You're like, is this pretty good? Does this meet my bar of excellence? I mean that yeah I know that it can get better but is is does this meet my minimal standards of excellence that's one of the things um it's like is there a floor beyond which you will not let something go out with your name on it you know that's one of the things you have to say is this good enough for me and then you also say how often am I doing this because you will get better as you do it more and more as a video editor in the professional sense in Hollywood since you started YouTube mm -hmm and the content creation in the schedule, how has your editing progressed in your professional environment? Oh, it's like here on my, in my professional mm -hmm, work? Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you there's been a change, and the number one change has been my expectation of how much I can deliver on a deadline. Mm -hmm. Like Early this year, uh -huh. actually was, I actually was doing a consultation with a very well-known and very well-respected YouTube consultant who said, dude, you need to establish a regular pattern, like a regular schedule of content creation. And I'm just like, dude, I, I knew you were going to say that. My life is packed. I have all these responsibilities, blah, 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 excuse, excuse, excuse. And, and he's like, yeah, okay. I, I hear you. I hear you. When you get to the point where you can establish a regular content creation schedule, it's going to be huge for you. And he was right. So what happened was I made a, I made a public you know, I say publicly, as of right now, it's actually on my channel art for the, for the channel. It's like new content every Wednesday. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a daily vlogger. I don't consider myself a, a vlogger just in general, but I, I, I don't do daily content. 
you got to be kind of you, you, you got to have a special kind of crazy <laughs> to do daily, yeah. uh, which is why I have instant respect for anyone who does it. Um, but I was like, OK, what can I do that is sustainable? that I can actually do this and not burn myself out. So I said, okay, I'm going to do something every week. And what that started was I started trying to do this big, fancy produced, edited piece, like what I would do for my gigs here in LA. I tried to do that on YouTube and I'm just like, I do, I do not have the time to do this at the level to which I'm accustomed. So I had to start thinking, how can I change the kind of content that I create? and how often I do it. So that's why I started going to a produced piece one week and then a live stream the next week. And that's what I currently do, I alternate. You, you, you have to figure out the variations in what you expect and what's realistic and what is sustainable in your content creation. So meanwhile, back to your question of like, how has that affected my professional work here? I know sitting down to record this right now, I there are two pieces that I need to finish by the end of the day. And I have been putting a lot of time and attention to say, what is realistic for me to get this done within the time that I have? And I know that I can finish those two pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was working at the Chive, the, that's one of the biggest things. When I, I went daily for a month, and uh, right. uh, and I was doing I was doing a daily uh, vlog f that month, and it was it completely changed my whole like I think my capacity as a video editor in a professional sense like skyrocketed because yeah. there there was so much of. <laughs> like there here's this shot it's a little shaky but and then like literally in my mind I could think what's what's important here like what what's the message I'm trying to get across and it comes back to the thing under the thing where where I was like going from piece to piece is like these looked nice this was this and then I could play the music in this way and get it to hit this way and do all this stuff and all that and then I it just drawed the curtain back and was like what's the most important thing that you're trying to get with this piece of content and reverse engineer it from there. Like, what are the things that you're like that you need to do? And then, it, like, it switched my whole mindset of like, all right, well, we I know we have that on camera. We have this other shot. We have these, and then it can go into all this other content. And it just made things so much clearer. Or what was imperative to be within an edit and tell a certain stories. And not only that, but it like my creativity in terms of telling stories for in the in that professional environment was like, oh, we don't have a shot of of that thing. We should just like go shoot this B roll and have it still look nice. But like, it's okay to like, oh, if you needed something like a stick figure doing um, another like a a good example of this is not to be long winded, but we were doing a charity piece and we didn't have, I had to tell the, her condition in the shortest time um, as possible. And she has like six different conditions, right? Oh, wow. So I had our graphic designers, I was like, we, we were under a deadline and I was like, I, I don't have any physical footage of like, I have her doing seizures and I have all this stuff. It's like very telling stuff, right? But um, I, I wanted to give the audience the, the whole spectrum of what she had. So immediately I was like, oh, let me just go grab one of the graphic designers. They're really good at drawing. It was like, here, here's a stick figure. Draw her as a stick figure. I'm going to give you the acronym of all the things that she has. And then they, they put them on there. And then every time I brought up a new condition, I would like, I would just do VO. I would like, I'd put VO into there and then I would explain the condition and then move on from there. Within like 30 minutes, we had the piece and then I slid that in there and it just tied everything together. But, wow. it, it, but it was just one of those things where I didn't have physical representation to tell that in a, the, the shortest amount of time, especially for the internet, you know? So, and it was like thinking about things like that, like I wouldn't even have like dreamt of like, oh, well, we don't have that footage. Guess I'll have to like bang my head against the wall trying to think of where the story is right here, you know? Yeah. Um, to that end, uh, speaking of music, what's interesting is that we're, we're both music majors, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I, is it a thing that like video editors are uh, into music as well? Like I, I cause you're not the first person that I've met that like has a music background and then also just like segued into doing video production. Yeah. Well, and I will say I, I've had a lot of producers say to me over the years that I've been cutting here, uh, they're like my favorite editors of all time all have a musical background mm -hmm. that's 
that's that's it, no, it's not just you. It's like it's, it's just weird to yeah. me that that's a thing. Like the well, way that the brain forms. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. There's a huge. There's a huge crossover between uh, because as soon as you get beyond like the mechanics of you know holding the instrument to your mouth and working the working the valves or whatever or, p- or pressing keys or, or or whatever the mechanics are of playing the instrument you start thinking about melody rhythm emotion pacing hello <laughs> that's that's exactly what you deal with when you're crafting when you're crafting something in the edit it's it's about story it's about through lines it's about emotion it's arcs character arcs story arcs it's just like you have you know, arcs, uh, arcs of mel- uh, melodic statements in a piece of music, it directly, con- it, it directly uh, follows into the edi- editing world too. Yeah, and I had other people have the same comment where they would they would say like putting music to the piece, and I, I know you talk about this on your channel uh, a bunch, in terms of j- a piece could just like you could slap the music underneath and then it could sound and it could uh, do something for to elevate the piece just a little bit, but um, putting forth the effort to find the right type of piece, which I think in the edit bay, if you're the one doing the music search, sometimes that can be the most time consuming part yes. of uh, telling a compelling story because you want everything to hit just the right way and then your your orchestra you're composing it you're composing a piece can you explain how you utilize and what you think about when you approach an edit in terms of telling the story with music yeah well first of all you have to know what the story is and what you want to say and then you start thinking about what matters to your audience and so what elements can you lean on editorially and feature them in such a way that they will land in a more meaningful way with your audience. And so, you know, for instance, uh, American Ninja Warrior, watched by millions of people on, you know, primetime network television. So it's a big, it's a big, broad family show. And so there are, there are different directions that you, that, that we don't, we just don't go on the show. Um, we don't get anything that's overly graphic or, or, or detailed in terms of the horrors that some of these people have experienced in their lives because we have kids watching, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, as you approach, as you approach all that stuff and you, and you keep that in your mind, it's like, okay, well, what, what's going to work with the audience? What are the elements that I have available to me? And now what emotions are we talking about? So we talk about, you know, well, let me think about of an example, uh, a, a piece that aired a while ago. There was an athlete whose wife has multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And, oh, good grief, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. Um, so this guy, like, and they're very private about it, and they had, they had been, they, they had decided that they were going to tell the story this season of the show. And so... What happened was uh, they, they talked about how, how the wife used to be super active. And now, like, since her diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, uh, of multiple sclerosis, she's gone downhill. And now she has to use a walker. Before, she was riding horses. And we showed her riding horses. And now, then, then you dissolve to her walking with a walker, like, struggling to walk with a walker through the kitchen. And you set that up. It's like, so here you have this incredible challenge and you have, like, and, the, and the shot and the shot that the piece ends with is literally this cowboy. They live on a farm. This cowboy picks up his wife and carries her off into the sunset. Man. You know, it's not just, um, it's not, this is a piece about a gal who has multiple sclerosis. This is about, this is about commitment. It's about a husband who is committed to his wife through, for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously that's something dear to my heart. You know, I'm married. I, 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 you know, I made that promise, you know, for better, for worse, richer, for poor, all that stuff. And so extended answer to your question of like, how do you use music to this? So the question is, all right, so this is the story that we have. This is the thing, but this is the, these are the things under the thing, all this super deep stuff that you can tie in all the visual imagery, like the cowboy carrying his girl off into the sunset, like all that stuff. 
And uh, what music do you put with that? Um, I score it like a movie, like a full on, like a John Williams score. You know, you start off, usually it's like because you're on a farm, you know, you're starting off on a farm, you use something that's more organic. So you don't want to use synthesizers. You don't want to use drum loops. You don't want to drop in a, a dubstep cue of music. You say, no Skrillex, <laughs> you know. A very complete paradigm shift right there. You know, it's like it's, you're, you're looking for something that's warm and organic. And you, and, and as things get more emotional, you just let that emotion land and you use strings your or orchestral cue with strings and just like however you can just that whole kind of a world and that's the direction that you go based on all this stuff that you've thought of before creating pieces that are that emotional mm -hmm. uh, as an editor i, I want to dive into that because the hardest pieces for me while i was at the chive was the chive charity pieces and okay. every every like four months we'd have like a, sto a story like that and actually the girl that i was talking about had ms okay um but to me, there's so much more. Um, I want. I just want to do right by uh, making the video as good as possible mm -hmm. for those people. And there's so much. Um, it gives you perspective in in like going home and uh, obviously being a father myself and seeing uh seeing what other families are going through and wanting to tell their story as like as impactful as I can. So in these cases would be to raise funds for they're having a surgery or they need an ADA accessible van or any of that kind of stuff, you know? In doing those kind of pieces, which I feel like in American Ninja Warrior probably happens like on a daily basis because you're finding the story or the through line be behind all these people and they're putting forth like, they're sacrificing a lot in order to become fit enough to do these challenges, you know? So I would think that it would be very rewarding working on those stories from day to day, but also like creativity and all those other things, like on a, on a macro scale, you're finding a story like daily for these, these people that run the challenge. And then within each one, they all present their own set of not problems, but challenges. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you, can you talk about um, perspective and relating to the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis for that? I would say it makes you think more intentionally about what's happening and what's driving it. Even something like relating with, with people. If I get angry, it's been said that anger is a secondary emotion. You know, if you're angry about something, it's the, the, the anger itself is not the thing. It's just the thing on the surface. I'm getting mad, but the question is, why am I getting angry? Why am I frustrated? And there's all sorts of reasons why that could be. You know, it's like one of the big things, uh, one of the big things is like, if I feel disrespected by someone, that brings out anger as a secondary emotion. So that's what people see on the surface, but that the thing under the thing is, I feel disrespected. So uh, in terms of content creation, I'm always on the lookout and I encourage and I encourage people to say, it's like, okay, well, if you think you have a boring life, if you think there, there's nothing interesting to talk about, the question becomes what's right in front of you and what does it represent? Mm -hmm. You know, something, uh, something I don't tell a lot of people is um, there is the, most days there is a stuffed there is a stuffed chicken sitting on the bed in my wife, on my wife's and I beds. There's a stuffed chicken sitting there, uh, hanging out on the pillows. Sometimes he's sitting, he's doing a headstand or sometimes he's just hiding under the pillows. But what that's a, you know, that's not just a stuffed chicken. That is the chicken, <laughs> DA chicken. Can't wait to see where this is going. <laughs> and what that is, uh, it's uh, what 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 that is is uh, when my wife and I were dating. Uh, I found this stuffed chicken mm -hmm. <laughs> in a store, and I and I took some pictures of it of myself with it. Uh, with him, with the chicken, and uh, I actually sent him in a package to my now wife when we were dating. Uh, that goofy little stuffed chicken has become a symbol of our relationship, which is why there's a stuffed chicken sitting on our bed at home right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, and, and so just, you, you tell people that and you're like, um, what? You have a stuffed animal on your bed? 
<laughs> two grown adults. It's like, what's, what's up with that? Well, it's, it's that, that's the thing. But the thing under the thing is, it's like, well, you, you, you have to be give your, you have to give yourself permission to not take yourself too seriously. Mm-hmm. And you also, uh, you also realize it's like, this was something that we exchanged. This was like my, my wife was living in Ohio when I was living in LA while we were dating, our entire courting was long distance. So the ways that we exchanged life with each other, um, a lot of talking on the phone, also just sending each other packages and stuff like that, that, you know, that becomes a symbol of, of our relationship and how we've grown. So, um, for people who are looking into how they can create content, there is always something under the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love talking to other editors and then just like getting their perspective on things because I feel like they they look at the life in general, not necessarily through a lens, but like like this room in general. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, what's the story behind the room that we're recording in right now? No. Or, or just like us meeting as, as like the physical representation of like our interaction right now, the story behind it, like oh, no. like oh, uh, I stumbled across you on YouTube, and you're you're like a digital person, and mm-hmm. whatever. Provide like I'm I'm sitting in an edit bay, and I'm like oh, I'm looking up. I don't know. I forget the very first video that I popped up with you, but I'm sure I was looking for something editing wise, right? And then you're you're on my screen, and then like fast forward like nine months later. Uh, like I'm here in in a space, like talking to you, like just knowing the context of what's happening. It's it's like that that kind of stuff I can talk about all that's, the time. It's cool, but but that also relates to like the voiceover thing too. What I, what we were talking about earlier was like, oh, if you hear the voice, then I like I start to backtrack of like, oh, somebody recorded that voice and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. But yeah, as we start to wrap up, let's talk about your 27 questions to tell a great story, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so can you give the listeners what that is and what you do on storygreenlight.com? One of, you know, one of the questions that I always ask myself is, I was like, how can I bring, how can I provide value? And I'm always looking to say, say, how can I give, give value to the people who inter- interact with me um, in person or digitally or whatever? And so um, one of the things that I came to realize is that when people say it's like, how do I create compelling content? How do I tell a great story? Uh, I keep coming back to the idea that like, you have to have asked a lot of questions. Sometimes it's just a few basic questions, but to really dial things in, you have to ask a whole bunch of questions that will shape the way that you shape your content. And so like over the last basically 20 years, I've been figuring out what these questions are and I've put them into a list that's, uh, that's available for, for download for free to anyone who wants to get a copy. Uh, it's, it's called 27 questions to craft the perfect video. And so what they are, it starts out with the question, like the question number one is what do you want to see happen with the piece? What do you want the outcome to be? You know, if you, uh, if you've ever, if you're familiar with the book, uh, by Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. His, uh, like, oh, dude, amazing book. <laughs> okay. Highly recommend. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I, like, the first thing he talks about is begin with the end in mind. And he tells a story about basically you're looking at your own funeral and what do you want to see happen to your own funeral? And uh, so I don't go quite that serious. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully. But uh, the, the question number one is, what do you want to see happen? What do you want your audience to know, do, feel, or experience after experiencing your piece? So that's ground zero. And then it goes on from there. It's saying, that's, that, that's what you want to see happen, but who is this for? And then that's when you start asking, like, who is my audience? What do they want? What do they expect? What do they not expect? Should you give them what they want? Should you give them what they don't want? Should you give them what they expect or what they don't expect? It's like, so all of a sudden you start getting boom, 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 boom. And then you, you, you start getting that stuff in and you're saying, okay, so what, how am I actually putting this story, putting this content together? Is there story structure available? Because story is so incredibly powerful in making human connections. And so you're saying, you're asking questions like, does this piece tell a story? If so, how? And it's just, you just go on and on from there. 
it's in, you know, it, it, it blows my mind how often that the answers that we're looking for, for how can we make this piece better, so often come from not just asking questions, but asking the right questions. So this is my offer to help people move along that journey for themselves. Mm -hmm. And even if you have, like, because obviously I've used it as well, had it posted right next to my computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, print off the checklist, here we are. Yeah, um, even if you already have a piece of content, you can uh, say you have your first rough draft or something like that, and you're looking at it, then you start to go down these questions themselves, and you're like, and then you start looking at them, and you're like, huh, start starting to address little snippets of whatever, and then if you can answer those within the context of the piece, it's like, okay, cool. It's like, yeah. It goes through the checklist and uh, it's like very extensive. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the thing is, you, you get to a point like I, I've basically internalized all these because I just, I, I use them every day. And so it's easy to lose sight of things. So there was a time when I was actually putting together like a video course explaining more about this download. And I was like, okay, fine. If I'm going to be putting together a training, an online training about this, I better like walk the walk and actually go through these questions myself. And I just sat there laughing at what happened because I used my own questions from the checklist that I put together and I actually answered them in the light of this training that I was doing. I'm like, and it changed, completely changed how I was approaching things. Mm -hmm. So it's like it, you, you will never run out of ways to look at what you're doing and to say, how can I shift context? How can I make things different? How can I look at this in a different way? Yeah. Again, what, what's the product? Um, well, and it's, there, there's a course, it's a course called basically 27 questions to craft the perfect video and it's a uh, video training itself. So, but the, uh, the checklist itself is available for anyone for download for free. But he goes into uh, much deeper depth for each question. Yeah. The last question I always ask everybody is in your line of work, if somebody, say they were just graduating from college or in your case, uh, leaving and then taking up the, the assistant jobs and all that stuff. Or, or even just like saying, it's like, hey, should I start a YouTube channel or, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. What's advice you would give them? I would say you have to decide what matters to you. It's deep. You have to decide what matters to you and you have to decide how you want to live in light of that. Um, I have found for myself that the greatest fulfillment that I have found for myself in life comes when I am operating within my strengths personally and I am using those strengths to be of service to others. And so I would say that, I mean, that, that's really been the key for me for finding, for finding a way that I can love what I'm doing and, and create good in the world. And so for people who are wanting to, who are, who are, who are saying like, should I start a YouTube channel or what's next? what's next for me in my job or like, what do I want, what impact do I want to leave in the world? I would say, I would say that, find out what matters the most to you and then find out how you can be of service to others in the process. I love how it's not even, um, it's not even geared towards like video editing or anything like that. It's more of a global, just from a person to person yeah. thing under the thing. <laughs> with Jeff Barch, Story Greenlight. Uh, where can people find you? Storygreenlight.com is the, uh, that, that's the easiest way. Uh, mm -hmm. You can look up, you can look up Story Greenlight on YouTube um, and you'll, you'll find us there. Man, this has been so good. Such good an awesome stuff. conversation. It's so cool to see you and meet you in person in the best place where I've ever done a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, and just thank you so much for this whole experience, yeah. especially for your time. And uh, definitely check out Story Greenlight, all the people watching this video, if you made it to this part, which I'm sure you have, because Jeff's an interesting guy. You can find me at Javier Mercedes X on all the social things, because Javier Mercedes was taken... And please, oh please, can you leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or if you're watching this on YouTube, do the whole subscribe thing. 
But literally, I'm just going to keep talking about leaving a review because the longer you talk about it, the more that people might leave a review. So I'm just going to leave a review, please. All right. So you're saying leaving a review is a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. So like as it cognizantly in the people that are listening to this, they might leave a review on the iTunes channel. Okay. Thank you again so much, Jeff. And until the next one, I will see you guys later.